to, to discussions. And what I would like to just reflect on a little bit is the campus and camps um, part of the of what Sandy and Alessandro talked about, because um, that's what uh, that's the context in which I met them and know them, and I've, I've been working with them there. But in order to, to reflect on campus and camps, I actually thought maybe I would say a little bit about the camps um, and the sort of the geography and, and inter interrelations of, of authorities in the camps. So as um, Alessandra mentioned, there are 58 Palestinian refugee camps across the Middle East in five different fields of operation, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, the West Bank, and Gaza. And those are five areas where UNRWA, which is the UN agency that provides relief to Palestinian refugees, works. And in every camp, there are multiple forces that govern, intervene in, and have concern with life in the camps. UNRWA is one of them, and UNRWA, as a humanitarian agency, perceives the camp first, camps first through the lens of being humanitarian spaces, and spaces where services are provided, and refugees are, are, are offered means to, to survive and, and to live. The second sort of set of forces are the host countries. So the Palestinian camps are in five different spaces with different political forces and authorities that have an interest in, in thinking about the camps. And in, for the host countries, the camps are both spaces of threat, right, potentially threat to those nation states, um, and spaces of political affinity, because the, at, at least nominally, each of the countries where the Palestinian refugee camps are is in a position of solidarity with Palestinian people. The camps are also of interest to Palestinian political parties, political movements, not to Palestinian nationalism, which is very important. And of course, camps are also spaces of people's experience, of community, of living. Um, and UNRWA, the host countries, and Palestinian political movements, each to a certain extent, try to fix the meaning of the camp, whether that is for administrative functioning, right? The camp is is this sort of space from an under perspective, and therefore we have to provide these kinds of services and not others. Palestinian political movements sometimes seek to fix the meaning of camps in, in ways that Sandy and Alessandra talked about as symbols of Palestinian um, politics, symbols of return, right? but at, in a fixed kind of way. But people's experiences in the camps are not fixed. Or people's experiences are multiple. And people live with, um, and sometimes live comfortably with, the kinds of contradictions that living in a camp over 65 years um, means, necessarily. Right? It, uh, over 65 years, a camp is not just a space of survival, it is a space of life. It is not just a space of deprivation, it is a space of politics. Um, but each of these other actors has a very difficult time grappling with the, the complexity of that experience. And that's where I think Campus and Camps intervenes so nicely, is that it starts from the condition of experience that people are actually having and living with and tries to, to think about how do we take this pragmatics of life in, in the camps and conceptualize it in a way that can not just articulate something about a, a refugee experience, but actually can intervene, again, not just in refugee lives, but intervene in how UNRWA is forced to think about the camps, intervene in how host countries, I mean, right now campus and camps is in the West Bank, so how the PA might have to think about the camps, and intervene in how Palestinian political discourse engages with the camps. So it, it doesn't impose or bring a politics to the camp experience, but takes the camp experience as a starting point for articulating a politics that, that people are, are already um, living with. Um, and I have a lot to say about the details and how that works, but I think actually I'll just stop so that we can get to questions. I'll be very, very brief and just really try, if I can, um, to make a few points. I met Sandy and um, Alessandro before Campus and Camps existed. And it was when they were working mostly on the decolonizing architecture project. And I have to say, I was absolutely blown away by what they were doing. Um, because there's something about the ways in which they combine what they think, what they say, and what they do, which is really what Foucault called a form of paricia, which is fearless speech. And it is this fearless speech that is both 
based on a risk. They put all kinds of things at risk. And at the same time, opened up this extraordinary multimedia space. Um, in their home, they had people coming from all over. I don't want to romanticize you, but it was really an extraordinary thing. Um, day, night, there was always food for everyone. They kind of lived this cooperative sense of, of artists, of people in visual and media, anthropologists, um, political theorists. Um, nobody didn't belong in this space. Um, and this was before they actually, and I, I, I hope somebody is going to talk about what this campus in camps is. It is taking kids, young people, probably some of many of your age, who um, are in the camps and thinking out loud with them about concepts and about the space in which they're living. And doing that conceptual labor, not as this authoritarian space in which we as intellectuals sit, but actually from the ground up, thinking of what are the concepts that actually work from the ground up. And um, I was just there this past spring, um, sitting in on one of the sessions, and it was, it was just such an enactment um, of it. I came to this myself um, because I've been working on colonialisms for some 35 years and have thought about how colonialism is a design. Um, and what they did, and why it was such a shock of recognition, is they were understanding that decolonization has to be by design as well, mm -hmm. right? But the first thing that really blew me away, and I'm sure I've gotten the question wrong, but it's what kept me going back as often as they would have me, um, is they asked, how do you live in the enemy's house? Is that... Right? Did I say that right? <laughs> because I wasn't sure, is it, how should one live in the house? How could one live in that house? Um, do you turn the entranceway around and make it face to another space? Do you change the, the infrastructure in some other form? Do you change the floor? What does it mean to do something that is absolutely impossible for all of the people who are involved in political um, rhetoric? And what is it to imagine something before the legal system actually puts that possibility into play? And that's actually extraordinary. It's not that it's emergent. They make it emergent in actually the work that they're doing. They bring into creation something that we talk about theoretically all the time, new, new epistemic political objects that congeal new possibilities around them. And um, I, I think that's really extraordinary. One of the things that they, they, they didn't talk um, about as much um, is that, no, well, they did. Maybe I'll go to the thing they did talk about a lot. Is this ambiguity and this tension between holding on to the, temp the provisional temporality and making a space that works for you to live in. The first times I went to various camps, there were no glass, um, glass on the on the on the stores. We don't, we don't, the between the you know, um, storefronts no glass. And then when I went back two years later, a lot of people had glass. And that right there in the detail of deciding that glass is possible. But one thing that really struck me is those people who chose to leave the bullet holes unplastered and those people who decided to plaster them over. Those people who decided, and the first thing they would take me to is the third floor where the, the wall was bombed out, and not continue the wall. And it seems to me that's, that, that remains such an extraordinary tension, and it's like they grabbed on in, in their practice to precisely that really, really difficult, um, detailed space. One of the things that I also think that they tell us, in a way, is that the kind of knee-jerk notion, this is a liminal space, it's actually not a liminal space in some other way. And we need another vocabulary, in a way, to talk about it. But I think it's too easy to think of it as a, a, a liminal between them. No, they're actually making it... Um, something um, very different. And the last point that uh, I wanted to make is this relationship. I'm, I'm not sure if I know it well enough. I'm sure I don't. It's not just the camp is creating something within the camp and stretching out its borders slightly. It actually is reconvening 
the entire space that's outside it and around it. Um, it's not that, that, that the practices stop at the door of the, of the camp. What was so striking is just how much that spread is and how much that's both politically, analytically, and ethically a part of the work they're doing. And I think it's amazing. <laughs> I um, have to note, and also try to be very short, and of course I also share everyone's deep uh, admiration for the work of Alexander. Um, we met, as you may remember, when Alexander Wagner, who is a colleague of ours here at the New School, um, edited a book for the Realist Center called Considering Forgiveness, and the, um, the first word, considering, is very important because we all, and all contributors to the book, we're very clear about the fact that, of course, um, forgiveness cannot be ever attained. But it's the process of beginning an acknowledgement of an adversary that is essential in clarifying a political or um, an emotional, um, psychological situation. Um, when I look at your work uh, briefly, what I'm most struck about is the fact that you provide a place that is always at the same time also another place. It's always the place of origin as it is the place of refuge. And this simultaneity of different um, modes of existence and awareness is key obviously to your project but also to the project of many other artists that I'm more familiar with being a curator. Um, and I am increasingly intrigued at how artists maintain the simultaneity of past and present, different locations, um, different sites, different awarenesses of consciousnesses, um, and others. And how, a bit like you said, and how this border is becoming um, activated is the convening site. It's not a site in, uh, in and of itself, but it's continuously reshaped by the awareness of those two um, sites coming together, the past and the present, the place of origin and the contemporary situation. Um, when I, you know, just naming a couple of artists, one of them would be um, Theaster Gates, who some of you know is very active in Chicago and has created a um, urban or rehabilitated a neighborhood in the south side of Chicago by renovating certain buildings and turning them somewhat into community buildings but not quite. So there is a archive of um, a sound library. There is also an archive of books. There is an archive of images that come from the University of Chicago. And all of them are available um, by appointment. So if you make a commitment to actually enter that space, if you cross the wall of the plaza into the plaza, then you have made a commitment. You have a pri the privilege of access. You have exercised that privilege but you also can choose simply not to engage. So the plaza that has a wall that needs to be penetrated um, and committed to and entered through, I think is um, relevant for, um, in the practice of someone like um, Theaster. Another person who comes to mind is Amar Kanwar, who is um, based in India <coughs> and has worked for a number of years with indigenous farmers in Odessa trying to redefine the kind of evidence that can be brought to courts and be le um, legally recognized by courts um, to extend and go beyond the notion of property or land rights or ownership of certain plot sizes. And instead of limiting evidence to just those factors, um, Amar in his work tries to introduce also categories such as history, collective memory, collective knowledge handed down through many, many generations and introduce that evidence as poetics into his courts. Um, and he, as he says, he's not talking metaphorically or symbolically, he means it literally. This is evidence and evidence um, that needs to be um, redefined and um, must include the term poetics. And the last person I'd like to bring up is um, Walid Rad, who has done a number of projects where the physical evidence refuses to collaborate or be read in the way we usually like to read it. Um, 
So, for instance, he is commissioned to or invited to do a retrospective of his work in Lebanon, which is where he's from. He sends off, after much hesitation, crates and crates and crates of objects that are all important for the last um, you know, 20 years of his artistic practice. The crate opens in Beirut, and all the objects, the artworks, have been reduced in scale by 50%. So he finds himself in front of this assembly of objects that are no longer what they claim to be, and as the tale goes in Walid's um, <coughs> narrative, it is because the objects cannot return to the site of the crime in the original form. The objects that were inspired by the Civil War in Lebanon refuse to collaborate. There are other projects where the paint or the pigment of a painting um, leaves the painting structure and all you have you're left with is a frame and then paint that is not that is detached from the surface of the fray of the um, of the work. This simultaneity of different conditions and fragmentation and collage um, seems really, really relevant to a lot of contemporary art practice and um, it's wonderful how you and combine physical evidence with political uh, goals. Uh, can I say one, how about one more thing? Yes. Just one more small thing. Is that I was thinking that one of the things we're always seeking to do, particularly at the New School, is to define what critique looks like. <laughs> And we have lots of definitions of it. But one of the definitions that it seems that Sandy and that Alessandro really take to heart and show us actually in its real vividness, it's not to be governed quite so much in this way by these people at this time. And it's one of the ways, you know, I'm always going back to Foucault. Foucault words it that way, but it actually seems that that's very close to some of of what the, what, what the impulse is to not succumb to the fact that one is being governed in that way, but that there are all these other spaces. So let's open it up to questions. Yeah, I want to um, start with continuing the question of Alessandro's um, ministry. What is this problem of lack of imagination of political? Um, why we can't be multiple identities at one? Why? What? I think one reason is because Palestinians are still daily experiencing this. They are being attacked daily because of their one identity, which is Palestinian, Arab, and Muslim. So these identities they cannot forget. Simply, they, they are still being attacked. They're still being intimidated, discriminated every day. So I think that's one reason that we just cannot let go of this. That we are Palestinian and then romanticizing that idea of what this person would mean. But I think this idea of um, practicing um, multiple, um, fighting for things in two places, I think that actually exists already. You can see it in many places in like trans I mean, transnational uh, activism. For example, I learned recently that uh, like Latino activists here in the US, when there was the AIDS crisis, when they were fighting for medicine to be like available for like communities like gay communities here they're trying to realize that they don't, they, these medicines don't exist in their countries of origin either so now there's this the fight is with the fighting with two systems at the same time and i think these are lessons that architecture and spatial practices can learn a lot from like social activism like like these activists they start to like fight with the local government in these latino countries and with the local government here, why these medicines are not accessible to people. I think this is the beauty of being in one place of having multiple identity. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, and I was listening to your uh, very interesting work. Um, I, and I was thinking that the problem, it seems to be the dual one. The traditional city, which is based on a collective member and then there's the modern sociological imagination in this space. Yeah. And one of the questions that came to mind, especially with the last slide you show, is that in traditional cities, you had migration patterns where people would settle in a part of the new city 
and form neighborhoods that were composed in part of the people that were in the city of New York. For instance, that's the way ancient national Africans were formed. And every year they would have festivals where they would remember the place of origin of these constituent groups. And so it comes to the question here in these camps, are these camps formed by people from all parts of Palestine or how much of the, 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 the progress of migration, what was the, 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 the route, the itinerary of movement? Are these camps formed from people from a certain collection of villages in Palestine or from, from all over? And how does that, if that's the, the origin of the population of the camp, how does that memory of, of the origin function? I would imagine that even though these people are farmers and all that, there is a very rich civic tradition in the Islamic Arab societies on, 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 on civic governance that is the first level, the first echelon for self-governance, even in, in this kind of displacement. You know? One sees that in other parts of the world. One also sees in other parts of the world how there is a coordination between that collective memory and settlement. For instance, I'm thinking of the uh, spontaneous rural settlements in Lima, Peru, that the government fostered, and where people basically built their, 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 their ten cities following rules that came directly out of the laws of the Indies, creating a first an enclosure to find a perimeter of space that was not moved over, but it's an acquisition of the West. And then there is, next to that, a later development that is She's saying, called a modern, modern uh, development. I just want to make sure a lot of people get a chance to ask questions. So that was my, my question. How does that, how does the memory, the tradition see, reflect itself in your private work? What commemorative uh, uh, centers that are based on the plan? Sorry, can I ask the people questions? Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to start without uh, not making a question at all. I thank you for your beautiful presentation and the description of the project that I'd like actually to know much more about in the details. Uh, and, and particularly it has to do with the details that I have a question. Because it seems to me that on the one hand, uh, you're describing a practice which marvelously extends uh, uh, the power and capacity of the residents of these camps and opens up new possibilities for them and actually very excitingly links these new possibilities on the ground with larger uh, social and political forces. And so that, that's really uh, vivid and, uh, and very interesting. But it also strikes me that you're opening up cans of worms. You know, that, that, that this has to be very, very problematic uh, and and it's, so, so the the story of the women in in the plaza uh, uh, sounds very exciting, but there there must be resistances to it, and and uh, and, and especially in the school, you know, you, 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 there's kind of radical pedagogic practice that you're trying to enable, and obviously the school teacher who's used to yelling at the parents who are used to having the school teacher yell have to be resisting. And I'd like to little, know a little bit more of that text, about that picture. Okay, so we'll start with three, and then we've got another three already to go. Is that fair? Do you want to take all of your questions at once? Mm -hmm. I don't know. There are lots more, but yeah, there's so many. Let's take the All right, so we'll go back. I just wanted to point out the incredible similarity between what you folks are doing and the situation here in North America with the Aboriginal Reserves in Canada, where I'm from, and here at the reservations in the United States. All kinds of similarities about rights to return, you've taken our land, not living in a full of conditions, being isolated, uh, young people uh, going to live in the cities, having no opportunities, whatever, when they get to the cities. And I wonder if you've ever tried to make those comparisons, because to me it seems so obvious that those comparisons need to be made. Um, you didn't talk about this, but I know that <clears throat> from my familiarity with your work, <clears throat> it's a thing that you could think about, and it's come up in a lot of different settings, and talking about architecture in Palestine, and relationship <clears throat> to settlements, right? The term that comes up, the you know, Cohen is the politics of vitality. Um, and I'm thinking, trying to, I'm curious about how that fits into your work, what you see 
Let's, let's transpose the politics of verticality from the settlements, conquering hilltops, looking down. And talking about building upwards in the pop rooms, the rooftops, how does verticality fit into the refugee camp? It's not on the hilltop in particular, but this building upwards, obviously because of the development limitation. So I don't know how you see that fit into your working with the trees. <laughs> you, want, you want to continue? You want to respond a bit? No, what I mean, it's. 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 It's.
it's so difficult the first time, and it's so difficult the second time, but slowly, slowly, when this image will become a sort of a huge one, one then people will accept it. And, and they know that it's about the first time. They know that, and this is why the first times we were all the time in many. I mean, the time we were cooking, we were in 50 women. I myself, I mean, I, I was the head of, of a department in the UN, which gave the other women some legitimacy to, to have some, and we invited many figures to be there so to sort of protect them. And now they are, uh, I mean, they are able to sort of take this ahead without us in that sense. They are, but, but to speak about resistance, it's absolutely, and, and I would not argue that it's only resistance from men's side, or sometimes the resistance comes much more, and I insist on this, from the women themselves, because they would auto-censor themselves instead of being only, of, of coming, so if you will help them, uh, help, I don't like the word help. If you would uh, sort of, uh, you know, accompany uh, them into understanding that they can make it, then you cannot train them anymore. And they are sort of trained that, that would go without that. Uh, so I don't know, maybe I forgot many things, but I, yeah, the, how, how the camp is, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, they are coming from many places in, in Palestine, but, but they came all in one, it's not like immigration that they sort of, the camp itself, was formed in, uh, in, in, in one manner. And then, of course, there were many movements here and there, but the camp is, uh, is many neighborhoods that are all together, and each neighborhood would represent one of the villages or the city. So you will find Yafa neighborhood, Zakaria neighborhood, and then slowly, slowly, they, at the beginning, they were living in the neighborhood, and they learned... Uh, the site project attempted to map the original place of origin in those neighborhoods? Yeah, there are many projects that goes into these directions, and I have to say we didn't do it because we know that there are a lot of work that was done in that direction, and we are busy in totally something else. So, uh, it's, uh, yeah. I don't know, I just found one Yes. I hope I answered everybody. This is what I hear the back. Okay. Um, I've been living in the Middle East for the past nine months, and I've been dealing with the refugee politics for like the past three months in Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan. So my question is, like, for example, I was in uh, Kobani and uh, Yufa building refugee camps for the Syrian refugees from Kobani. So how are you, are you able to get the information that you've learned there and basically push it into Turkey and to other places? Because right now, it's like there's an urgency to build these camps. So are you able to give your information to them to actually help them? Because like, for example, in Turkey, the leases they have for the land is only for five years, but you can't necessarily have a tent city for five years with, and have it be practical. Okay. I'm interested in your residency program, and I was wondering if you could just talk about it. Um, I know bringing up capitalism is taboo, but um, when a refugee leaves a refugee camp, right, and enters a space that's been, you know, quote unquote, normalized or, or a profiteer, I'm thinking of like Ramola, Rabobi, um, Rabobi being a new city which is designed to have a certain middle class lifestyle for mm. a Palestinian. And I'm wondering if these spaces are antagonistic to what you view as a narrative of, um, of return. In other words, is return something that's physical? Do you actually move yourself to a new space, back to where the state of origin was? Or is it some place that you find a completely new experience in, which here in the States and in the continent of the West, we know, we know of? Uh, two questions about football. One is before you build the plaza, where did people play football? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, uh, from the point of view of your work, what do you think about the stadium that was built that you showed? No, the second yeah. question would be about think? the stadium. What yeah. do you think about the stadium you show us? Because you just talk very quickly, so you can feel what I'm Yeah, I Thank you for the very interesting talk. I have a very simple question. Did the plaza serve any kind of uh, civic slash political function in the, uh, in the camp, or was it just a 
just a thing that changed a little bit social relations were the, were the consciously appropriated for the for the civic slash political purposes. <coughs> of relevance to to share experiences uh, among folks. I think definitely it's something um, very important that we um, we try to do and one uh, one case was also in uh, in Turkey um, in which one of um, um, one person that visited campus in camps she um, after our visit she brought with her our publications that are not only in English but also in Arabic um, and in a way what she said that this also changed uh, and helped her a lot to, to work with, uh, with the refugee um, community there um, uh, and this was just let's say one case in which there was a sort of um, you know direct in that sense direct use of, um, of the materials that were uh, produced. Um, I think after this couple of years, this, we were in a moment in which, in one way, we, I think it's very important, we try to make a lot of connection. At the same time, we know the, the, you know, the danger and, and the traps in, uh, in then transforming campus in camps as a model. Um, and this is it's a big dilemma. That's why before I said I will not I will not talk about things that I'm certain. I mean I know or I guess I, I know how to do things. But one of the big dilemma that we have at this moment is if campus in camps should be institutionalized inside the university, it should be uh, used in other context. Because in one way, it, it's a very attractive hypothesis, and it already, for example, we had, when we were in Brazil, already, you know, people said we should have a campus in Islams, um, and I think already made parallels between, let's say, the camp and the slums in terms of the right to return is also, you know, something very interesting that, um, in a way, was uh, generating a lot of interesting idea, because they were changing completely the perspective, because in that case, in some cases, is the right to stay very important for them, uh, because and, and, and also in relation. Sorry, I'm if I'm moving this, but just to say how is productive sometimes this make this comparison, but cannot be that one thing became the model. Because for example, when we start to transfer some of these concepts in the case of of the slums, I think we understood things you know were working in a completely different way. One example was just saying you know the right of return. There, it's about the right to stay, which is a very important, you know, the right of, of the, this house that you build with all the sacrifice. I mean, it's very important for, for people to stay and not to be, you know, moved. But also in relation to the idea of normalization. And this is where I think, and there is, I think the process of exchange is interesting when things can be politicized. Because, for example, what we notice is, that in a way in which people talks about upgrading slums, it's always a very good thing to do. No, you go there, but if you take the Palestinian perspective on improvements, you start to problematize that. Mm -hmm. What is the interest? Why now suddenly, after you know so many years, in which all these cities were constituted majority by informal architecture, suddenly now there is all this attention. Suddenly. You know, you have programs everywhere in trying to upgrading things, you know? Maybe very good intention. But if you take the perspective of the camps, I think you might look at things in a bit different ways, you know? And this is where maybe trust, transferring somehow or sharing this different experience could be, could be interesting. But I also, you know, I'm scared, for example, where I'm having now this discussion with university and, you know, after half an hour trying to explain what I would like to do, what I imagine, they say, yes, what is the title of the course that you want to teach? <laughs> and how many credits? And so, in one way, I'm very attracted to think how all of the collective dictionary could be like part of the curriculum. But at the same time, 
it's I see that is there is like a huge um, gap in between what we experience and and what could be then something that became you know bureaucratized and and, and became something that maybe um, so it's not in fact uh, an answer to this actually if if you have uh, some ideas you know how to to try to articulate this elements I mean I would be happy to uh, to listen to you, but um, so definitely yes, I think making this comparison is interesting, but also we have to be very, um, very careful. And um, maybe a few words about the residency. Um, I think also, as just Anna said, it was for us very important that um, we leave the project that we do, and it's the only possibility to to live in Palestine. Without this project, I think it would have been impossible. I don't know for how long we can actually continue to do this, because it's very consuming. Um, but this is the, was the only possibility to, to transform the place of our office you know, into, into a residency, in which people could come all over the world um, and could, could join the program. Not always works. You know, We have one friend that he tried to to join this residency that we started in uh, in November. He was detained for 11 hours at the airport and then was sent back. And he's, he's, he's now there. Yeah. for the first time meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and this goes back also to the problems, you know, that we, you know, we face in, uh, in this situation, you know, which we have a very uh, fragile uh, condition, you know, uh, there. And this is also what makes our own life very close to, to refugees. You know, we learn you know very much actually from uh, from this. Um, so practically, the residency works that there is you know there is a call and um, and then people could uh, come and join and work together in a project that are established. This is also one of the important thing that we come up with a sort of uh, combination between an architectural studio and art residency. And the reason is that architects learn how to work together. Not all the artists know how to do that, I have to say. <laughs> but the very nice thing, yeah, about getting artists, not only, let's say, the architects, that, you know, how not to professionalize, you know, the work. So the artists, you know, in their, you know, way of, of uh, being in that sense, not only attached to to the materiality of the urban space, to the space, I think, brought up always different perspectives that help uh, very much the studio not to crystallize on um, on becoming a professional a professional studio. And one and one thing that also it's similar in that sense maybe to um, to an artist that we we don't have um, um, a, what's called it? The, the, someone that asks us to do a specific work. So in that sense, we work more like artists, that we decide mm -hmm. what is relevant. So we decided that that was the time to imagine what to do with you know, the, um, the colonies after they would be evacuated. We imagine, for example, to think about the, the return. The beginning was like you know, scandal. You know, why, and why you ever think about this? This is impossible. Why? Who, who gave you this? Uh... But then it's also interesting because when you go and then talk with UN, with the quartet, with you know all these political actors, they said you know at the moment we know that you know um, we we cannot be close to what you are really doing, but also we have we learned that they are in a way following us. You know they 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 because you know in a sense for them is also a way to anticipate things that mm -hmm. you know could happen in the future, and this is definitely the case in which, for example, when we design all the um, possibility in which colonies could be um, transformed. Um, you know, secretly the Minister of Planning, the Palestinian Minister of Planning was, you know, kept copying these things and was using in negotiations. Which, yeah. At that time it was secret. I mean, we were not aware of it. But, you know, these are just some things that says that, uh, yeah, we believe that this is, um, this is what we want to do. I mean, in the moment, actually, there is someone asks us to do that work, maybe we don't have to do it anymore because it would be maybe all the people that actually would be, would be doing this.
and we didn't answer on, on the question. One, one is about the civil, uh, civil politics, if there is any political purposes for the plaza. And I have to say that we began the plaza a bit before the Egypt revolution and, and the, the Maidan Tahrir. And, the, and one of our main, uh, main question was, what does it mean? in Palestine being a very colonial place to speak about collectivity and about being in public because I mean I lived under occupation for all my life and for all my life I saw that the main purpose of colonialism and occupation was to kill any collectivity. I myself studied in, in neighborhood schools. The schools were closed for four years during the first intifada because it was so clear that if the Palestinians are together, this is the most dangerous thing. And the problem is that uh, public space was totally killed in Palestine, and then when the Palestinian authority came, there was no reflection on how eventually we could rebuild this public space, because without building the idea of how can we eventually be together, this would be impossible to sort of even think about what kind of future society, Palestinian society might look like. And actually, I remember when the revolution came there, I mean, when, the, when there was the Maidan Tahrir and everything, and the leaders in refugee camp came to me and they said, this, this was the reason why you was all the time speaking about plazas, because I made the <laughs> CEO of plazas. So no, it wasn't my intention. But of course, one of the things is that how it's, it's all about yeah. politics, is how you can create collectivity is the question in Palestine. It seems not the question, but, but I think it is uh, the oh, main mm -hmm. question. And then the stadium, I think that actually the stadium was not something that we did. It was fully, I mean, all the other projects we saw initiated by us, I mean, the plaza, the school, and the stadium is a project that was fully done by the community even before we came in, but the issue that it's, we sort of consider all these attempts, very important attempts for us to understand, again, the public and, and from which angle we could, uh, we are lost. I mean, we, we want to look at any experience that brings us to this. Uh, and then about if the return is physical, I mean, I, I, it's not necessarily, uh, our main thing, as, as we explained there, is how the life of the refugees and their life of exile is not in contradiction with their return. How can we combine both together in order for them to be able, and in order for us, I mean, I, I, to understand how eventually a return might be a possibility. It's not important if it's physical, less physical. Some of them will decide to return back to the Mediterranean. Other, I, I might only decide to go and visit the Mediterranean and stay on the beach. Or many, many people, I assume, would decide to go and be buried in Palestine. And they might, they might decide to still live in, their, uh, in, in the States or everywhere. And then to ask simply to be buried where they want to be buried. I mean, there are many forms of return. And, and our main issue with the return is that it's, there is only one way of speaking about the return, which makes the return an impossible topic to even to imagine in, in that sense. So this is why we think it's returns instead of return. <coughs> Well, I'll say one thing. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, this is something that Alessandro talked about when he was speaking, and some of the questions gestured to, which is, what are the paths that people are in, are thinking about living their lives in relation to? And this also goes to the question of return. And one of the things that's very striking about the camps is that people live in relation, have a memory of villages of origin, a sense of home, but as much people live in relation and narrate their lives in relation to the, the camp as a place with a history and a past. And that is one of the, another one of the things that I think that campus and camps is, is engaging with and activating, not bringing into being. People live with these things. And when you, when you talk to people about life in the camp, they refer not just to what was in Palestine or what may be in some imagined Palestine, but also what was 
here in the camps, and that that is part of Palestine itself. And so that I think is very important yeah. in thinking about the question of both returns and what it means to intervene in these spaces, is to engage with this full range of temporalities that people are living with. I just wanted to say something, not really a question, though. I just said it's very important to remember that the, the refugee camps inside Palestine are totally different from the refugee camps in Lebanon and also in Jordan. And the right to return, I think, I've seen the, like, there's a totally different line. They're basically isolated, in a sense, from the Jordanian people and the Lebanese people. So the right to return, in a sense, is looking at a normal person who's born in Lebanon, who has a Lebanon passport, and saying, like, if I go back to Palestine, I will be able to have that life that he has outside of the state. So I think that's very important to remember as well. Last words. Oh, thank you so much.